no need to live in anxiety. There's no need to sit here and go, is this going to happen again? What if I die tomorrow? What if? You shouldn't be here. You yeah. already died once. Go out and get after it, man. Don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do. You know, they told me I couldn't go back to work. They told me I couldn't do SWAT. They told me I couldn't do this. It's, no. Get after what you want to accomplish in your life and don't take no for an answer. Welcome to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. My name is Yelis Fass, your host and a cardiac arrest survivor. Here on this podcast, I chat with fellow cardiac arrest survivors to provide support for other survivors through this wild post-cardiac arrest journey. Now, in this episode, I had the pleasure of talking with Brandon Griffiths, a police officer who, as you might have guessed, had a cardiac arrest. Now, as to how, where, and who saved him, I'll let Brandon tell you about it himself in the conversation. After his cardiac arrest, Brandon founded Griffith Blue Heart, a non-profit organization that specializes in training, preparing, and equipping law enforcement for cardiac emergencies. I highly recommend checking out the website griffithblueheart.com uh, to see the services they provide, but also for the events they hold. Brandon occasionally hosts live events with experts and cardiac arrest survivors on topics related to fellow survivors. Again, have a look at griffithblueheart.com. As always, to find any other resources and ways to connect with Brandon, check out the show notes located in the description of this episode. One final thing, my recording studio connected the wrong microphone while recording, meaning the audio quality on my end is, yeah, it's not the best. I do apologize, this is a dumb mistake on my side, which I can assure you will not happen again. Luckily, Brandon mostly steals the show throughout this conversation. Anyway, I hope you will enjoy this episode and find insights, advice and support from cardiac arrest survivor and heart warrior, Brandon Griffith. Brandon, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. It's, it's awesome to finally talk to you. Uh, it's my pleasure, man. Thank you for having me on today. So, you know... If we would just like jump immediately kind of into it, how, you know, did you had a cardiac arrest, when and also, you know, who, who managed to save you? So uh, I'm a police officer and I wish I could tell you that I was doing something cool. I wish I could tell you that I was in a foot pursuit or fighting a suspect or anything, but <laughs> like four out of five cases and I'm sure just like yours, mine happened at home. Uh, yeah. My wife makes fun of me because I've been shot at. I've been in knife fights. I got trapped under a vehicle in a water rescue, but I died at home reading a book. You just can't make it up, man. So I was in my den. I was sitting with my wife. She was on a computer doing some work. I put the book down and said, hey, I'm going to take the dog out. I took two steps towards my door, and it was like someone hit me in the chest. And for most cardiac arrest survivors, they don't remember their incident. They wake up in the hospital and told about it later. But I remember every intricate detail of my, of my death. So I was sitting there, and I remember something just didn't feel right, and I could feel this this flutter and these palpitations going on in my chest with like this electrical storm. And even though I collapsed in about a second and a half, I experienced time distortion. Everything just slowed way down on me. So I remember trying to force myself to breathe and not feeling right, and my jugular veins popping out and trying to breathe. So in, in military and law enforcement, we're taught to do combat breathing. Combat breathing lowers your heart rate, lowers your respirations, helps you kind of control the mind and control stress. So I was trying to do combat breathing, but it turns out when you're in cardiac arrest, your lungs physically cannot expand with oxygen because there's no blood being pumped to them. So I was in agonal breathing, just go <coughs> trying to force myself to breathe. My wife hears this and turns around to look at me. She sees my face as the darkest purple she'd ever seen. She immediately pulls out her phone, puts it on speaker, calls 911 for help. I collapse backwards into my bookshelf. Now she tries to go brace me, but my wife is five foot three. I'm six foot four, so I toppled right over her and put my head through the wall. I land on my hands and my knees, and I'm still, I still got that warrior mentality. I still, I have to fight through this. I gotta win. I gotta win, and I'm trying everything I can think of to to stay in the fight. But here I'm looking out in my hallway, and I'm starting to get tunnel vision. And it's not like, it's not like normal tunnel vision in the field where you have trouble focusing, or it's like you're looking through a coffee straw. It's more like this dark, dark purplish and black and like the silhouettes and shapes are losing their distinctiveness. Everything's kind of 
fading out on me. Well, now I'm being told later on from the doctors that that was the blood, gravity taking blood from my brain and my eyes. So I was literally watching myself die. So in that moment, that complete helplessness, I just, I remember that feeling of being like, well, this is it. And at that moment, here I'm a cop, I'm an EMT, I've saved I don't know how many lives using CPR, and in that moment, there's not a damn thing I can do to save my own life. And that complete helplessness is just something I don't wish on anybody. I collapsed, dropped dead right there, my wife rolled me on my back, she starts doing CPR on me. Uh, she was worked on me for about four and a half minutes for the first responder to arrive, but she did a phenomenal job. I mean, I, I, I work with physicians and providers around the world, and I can't get ER docs and nurses to think the way she did in that moment. I mean, she even put my feet up on the couch in Trendelenburg. That way, oxygenated blood on my legs was had gravity forced it down to my yeah. core. So she, she worked on me. Yeah, so we were both EMTs together. She had just oh. been accepted to medical school, but she had not actually started yet. She was going to start that fall. So she worked on me. The first officer arrived. So she, you know, stops, unlocks the door, pulls the dog back. The police officer mm -hmm. came in. He was not equipped with an AED, but he did a phenomenal job doing uh, cardiocerebral resuscitation. So he jumped on my chest and worked on me until the nine and a half minute mark when fire and EMS arrived. They drag my body in the living room and they got more room to work. They IO drill me. They drop in the OPA. They start, you know, pumping all the fun drugs and stuff. Uh, they shocked me multiple times with the defibrillator and most, uh, all in all, I was dead for 16 and a half minutes before they were able to resuscitate me. According to my wife and crew, I kind of sat up, started pushing guys off me. I don't remember that part, but my wife grabbed me by the face and said, don't leave me. I said, I won't, before collapsing back onto the gurney. And I remember I remember feeling the sway of the gurney, and I could hear the, the firefighters walking on the rocks in my front yard. And according to the crew, I was in the back of the ambulance cracking jokes, calling them hose draggers and whatnot. I'm still friends with the guys to this day, but... I woke up in the hospital the next five days are a complete blur from that moment. I remember I remember the pain. I remember coming back. I remember my head just feeling like I was getting hit with a sledgehammer. The, I could feel the pain in my chest, the IO drill. I could taste the blood in my mouth. I remember all that. But the next five days when my brain was recovering from hypoxia, I was just in and out of consciousness. And it's more clips and phrases, you know, little tiny memories. Wow. It's crazy that you actually remember, like, so much before it happened because most people like I I know nothing of it well I was asleep too so yeah okay but most people that I talk to don't remember anything I've only met two survivors around the world that actually remember any part of their incident before they collapsed and they're the only I've been, I've been very fortunate I work with survivors internationally and I've only met two in the entire world that actually remember going mm -hmm. down and remember their incident wow and wait it was in the room that you're currently sitting in no, no, this was, uh, we're in a new house, so this was, okay. you know, yeah. this was almost, this is nine years ago, as of last week, so we were in a, I lived in a different city, I lived in a different house, I had a different setup, so, no, it wasn't that bookshelf, it was, I had a big couch in my den that I, my, my wife put my feet up on, so, no, different, different environment. Yeah, so, I mean, you do have an ICD too, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sure do, yeah. They took me to the hospital and they started doing all the fun tests and they did everything possible. And, you know, I laughed because I was actually at the doctor's office two hours before I went down. You know, I was get, I just made my department SWAT team and we doing all the medical stuff. I did an EKG, I did all the tests, and they, everyone's like, well, they should have figured it out. And I said, no, it was an electrical malfunction. And they have no idea what caused my cardiac arrest. They've broken my blood down to chromosomic levels looking for genetic mutations, but it was an idiopathic. So, I'm one of the survivors that, several survivors never get a diagnosis. It's like, hey, is it going to happen again? Well, we don't know. All right, well, if it does, you got this defibrillator in your chest, and here's some medicine to prevent you from having any further issues, but they never found my diagnosis. So it, it wasn't a big deal to me at that point until later on in life when I started having kids. And I was like, well, we don't know why I died. Did I unknowingly pass on some genetic mutation to my children? Do I have to worry about them collapsing when they're by themselves sure. or when they're around somebody who's untrained? Yeah, and they don't have any hypothesis of, like, why it could have happened. Like, no idea at all. So, it, it, officially, it was idiopathic diagnosis, meaning the doctors are idiots and couldn't figure it out, right? So, yeah. with me, I'm, I'm convinced that I had what's called the RNT phenomenon. I, I, I believe that I had a preventricle contraction at the absolute wrong time, and when I had that RNT, it just it sent me into ventricular fibrillation. And, you know, that can happen to anyone, anywhere, anytime. As you know, being a survivor, young athletic males are actually at the highest risk. And, 
here I mean I just made my SWAT team two weeks before this so I was in phenomenal shape there was no stress there was no other no congenital issues there was no plumbing issues no electrical history no family history of it just mm. boom drop dead crazy it's always so crazy to hear something with people who are just like in complete good health and it happens to them right it sounds like it, but it happens every day. You know, a thousand Americans per day die from it. Around the world, we lose 17 million people globally of cardiac arrest, and most of them are young athletic males when it comes to the electrical malfunctions. Your Brugadas, your Wolf Parkinson's Whites, your cardiomyopathies, your long QT syndromes, all these things that happen that most people don't have any signs or symptoms of until they just suddenly drop dead. Yeah, yeah. And this was nine years ago. Since then, you... Like, how how was the recovery for you, actually? Like, from that time to now, yeah, how was it? So I started off pretty rocky, I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Literally, in a heartbeat, my entire life changed. So, yeah, uh, of course. I, in the hospital, I was asking when I can get back to work, and it was kind of like, mm. <laughs> you can't go back to being a police officer. You can't carry a gun. you got a defibrillator in your chest. You can't, all your medical, all the all the things and devices you carry, you're going to mess sure. your defibrillator, and it was like, you got to be you gotta be kidding me. So I lose my spot on my SWAT team. Here I am, 26. I'm a field training officer. I'm a defensive tactics instructor. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm an FTO, and I'm loving it, and all of a sudden you're telling me that I'm damaged goods and I can't go back to work. So I had uh, the six months after that, one, we're still trying to figure out why did I die? Is this going to happen again? I'm getting used to this new device in my chest. I'm getting used to the medications they're putting me on. I got all these restrictions and whatnot. So it, it, was, it was a different dynamic. And now I, the mental health roller coaster that accompanied that was not fun, but I had to try to get back to work. And it was at the time, I luckily had my assistant chief of police who had my back and said, you know, we're not going to let them get put out to pasture. So I had to go and I had to fight the state and I had to fight risk management and I had to fight my city to return to work. You know, a lot of survivors, you know, if they're working, you work at the post office, you're a lawyer, you're even a doctor, they don't question it. You can go right back to work. But for police officers, firefighters, military members, as soon as you have a cardiac arrest, you're pushed out the door. So I literally had to fight to keep my job, and I had to bring in cardiac arrest researchers and experts to testify on my behalf, and I had to get information. There was nothing out there. There was no playbook, and I tried to reach out to survivor groups. I tried to figure out, you know, what are my rights under the Americans with Disability Act? What are my rights with HIPAA? What are my rights with, you know, OSHA and workers' compensation stuff? Like, how do I get back to work? And I couldn't find anything. I reached out to survivor groups. I was like, oh, you want to come share your story? No, I don't want to share my story. I want to know, do you guys have like an employment lawyer? Do you guys have, what do I, What can I expect with my medications? What happens with this defibrillator in my chest? I have all these questions. And like, like you probably were, you're slapped on the back and told how lucky you are. And you're pushed out the door of the hospital. And you're like, well, shit, what now? Where, where, where do I go from here? There's no playbook. And at, back then there was no, there was no survivor groups that were passing out resources or pamphlets. It was just kind of, you're left to your own demise. So a... I had to do my own research. You had to dive in and basically become an expert yourself. I had to start reading medical publications and have my wife, you know, translate it for me because I'm a dumb street cop. So I had to figure out, you know, what happens with my portable radio? What happens if I get tased? What happens if this? And I had to tase myself just to figure out how I can go back to work or not. And it was... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the Wait, questions... Wait, what, what, hap what happens? <laughs> So one of the questions with my command staff was, hey, what happens if you get tased? And I said, you know, that's yeah. a great question. Let me find yeah, out. Of so I called the manufacturer on my defibrillator, and they sent me to research and development, and I asked all these questions, and they're like, we don't recommend it. I said, well, no, what happens if I get tased? We don't recommend it. That's, yeah, if you don't have any research, course. tell me you don't have any research. But I, I'd like mm -hmm. to know if there's anything uh, so I can bring it back so I can try to continue to keep my job. And they couldn't give me an answer, so I called, you know, the makers of Taser at the time, and I said, hey, you know, I'm a defensive tactics instructor, I'm a Taser instructor. I said, do we have any research on this? And they said, it's not recommended with people with pacemakers or defibrillators. I said, okay, but, you know, do you want to do a study? I said, let's bring it. I said, I'm a cop, I'm a defensive tactics instructor, I'm a survivor. You guys can tase the shit out of me, and let's do a study out of it. And basically everyone was like, no, 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 we're not, we're not going to touch that. Nobody wanted to, no, no one wanted to do it. So for six months, I couldn't get any answers, and I'm like, you know what? I train brand new officers out of the academy. These scared bunnies that some kids that have never been punched in the face before. And when they get in these, these high tense environments and they have to start going hands on with people, a lot of times the first thing they do is grab their taser and get on it, right? So if they miss and tase me, which happens which happens around the country all the time, 
I had to know if I get tased, am I going to drop dead? Am I going to get shocked? Am I going to stand up? Am I going to feel funny? I had to know for myself. So, I mean, I didn't have doctor permission or anything, but I called my SWAT medic and I said, hey, buddy, bring your monitor over here. I'm taking a ride. He goes, what? I said, I got to know for myself. So I, I tased myself. I took the two prongs and, you know, it sucked for five seconds and I stood up and I'm like, well, I didn't get shocked. And I, I scheduled it for the same day that I was getting my defibrillator checked. So I go in, they go to interrogate my device, they hook me up on the magnets, and the guy's kind of looking through it all, and I said, hey, how's everything look, man? He goes, everything's fine, why? I said, oh, I got tased this morning. He goes, you did what? And I said, well, I said I wanted to see what it would do with my device, and he t looks at me and he goes, you realize you could have reset this back to factory settings, you could have turned on the pacemaker function, you could have had all these complications. And I said, really? And you knew that. He goes, well, yeah. I said, then why the hell wouldn't anybody give me that answer for the last six months I've been calling you guys? Well, you know, for liability. So it's, li it's liability until I do it to myself. Then you can talk to me about it, huh? So I, mm -hmm. I, there's, there's so many things that happen in those communities that they don't want to talk about because they're worried about getting sued. But it's like, you know, for yeah. survivors, we don't have that option. We have to, we have to know what's going to happen to us. So it was, right. it was a different ball game. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... And how long did it take them for you to finally be accepted again to do or to continue in your work? So I, it was a good six months before I finally got cleared for light duty. And then it was a little mm. while after that where I finally got cleared to go back to the streets. And I was, that was literally having the state EMS and trauma director, who was a cardiac arrest researcher, and the creator of Hands Only CPR, literally say, hey, he's good. There's nothing wrong with him. Not only is he safer than any other officer out there. He's on medication to prevent him having an incident now, and he's got a device in his chest that shocks him if he happens to lose consciousness. The other officers who are ticking time bombs that are at a 70 times higher risk of heart disease, they could drop at any minute. They've got clogged arteries and heart attacks and aneurysms and strokes and myopathies and all kinds of other issues. He's safer than any one of them. He's been checked with a full bill of health. He's got no restrictions. Let him go back to the field. So it was successful, but it was still a while, man. Like, you know, Obviously, it's not your information is not protected. As soon as you have that, everybody in the world knows you had a cardiac arrest. So they all have these questions. They all know you. They all know your private details. And you know, at first, everyone was treating me like this fragile China doll. Hey, can can you do this with your heart condition? I'm like, I don't have a damn heart condition. No. So I was doing mountain bikes. I was doing you know 5K obstacle courses. I was I had to out bench. I had to out fight my guys before they would actually realize that I'm not some cardiac patient. I'm not some old feeble guy that's going to grab my chest and fall over. Like I had to, and it, that's still a stigma that I still face today. People will see you and be like, Oh, you're a cardiac arrest survivor. You know, can, are you sure you can do this? Can you get, yeah, you have to get waivers. Like, you know, simple procedures for medical stuff that you would think would be perfectly fine for dental work or you, Hey, I might get a vasectomy. And they're like, we got to get a cardiac clearance because of your history. You're like, what the heck does my balls getting snipped have anything to do with getting, getting a, a cardiac sure. clearance but you know they put you in this box and they want to they want to label you there's so many stigmas out there we're trying to break yeah yeah they want to be really really careful with you right to not do anything wrong but it can be like too careful that you feel like yeah like you said like a fragile person that just breaks immediately uh, and i personally hate it too i'm i'm also like well i'm a very adventurous person i would say i climb a lot of mountains and um yeah, in the beginning, everyone was also like always worried, like, oh, are you going to be fine? Uh, but it took a while for me to feel like people taking me more serious that I was fine in a way and that I was not some fragile person breaking down every time that I was climbing a mountain or anything. Uh, so, yeah, I feel you like in a way that if you are like you are like a very active person, we have to like extra prove ourselves in a way, right? It's not just that, too, but all the other questions we have, too, because there's almost no studies out there, especially on long-term effects of antiarrhythmogenics and beta blockers. When you start talking about the side effects and stuff, you start trying to figure things out, and you have all these other things that have been compounded. Like, are you on any medications? Uh, yeah, I am uh, on a very uh, amino adora or something. It's, I don't know. Amida, it's a beta blocker, I, yeah, yeah. No, it's so, not a beta blocker. I was on beta blockers for a long time, and now I'm on Amio Darona. It's something different that they're trying at the moment. Gotcha. Now, uh, how, do you have any kids? No, not yet. All right, so that's one of the things they don't tell you about is the medication, the cardiac medications slow down sperm motility. 
So after being on it, you got these high school kids that start taking these medications and, you know, at 15, 16 years old, and by the time they start having kids in their early 20s, mid-20s, they're having problems having conception, and they have no idea, man, why, they think something's wrong with them. So I did, man. My wife and I tried for over a year, and we're like, what's going on? Like, there's nothing wrong with me, and we actually were going to a uh, fertility specialist, and they went through, and they're like, I don't get it. You've got sperm count through the day, through the roof, and, you know, you've got a huge, you've got high testosterone, and everything should be working, but for some reason, you got slow swimmers, and I'm like, what the hell? So it turns out, well, you know, it makes sense. The anti-rheumogenics and the beta blockers, they slow your heart rate, they slow your metabolism, they slow down everything. Of course, it's going to slow down your sperm motility, and it wasn't until one of the cardiac arrest doctors that I work with said, dude, it's, it's your medication. Oh. I said, I, they never gave me any warnings about that. They never told me anything about it. He goes, well, of course not. There's not enough research. They can't talk about that kind of stuff, but it just makes sense. And I said, okay. Talked to my electrophysiologist, got off it. Instantly, my wife got pregnant, and I went back on the medication. I'm like... The first try, you got to be kidding me. So that's stuff they don't talk about when it comes to fertility, when it comes to, oh, by the way, the medications you're on are going to cause a whole bunch of other complications. So it kind of becomes a, a risk-reward analysis. Oh, yeah, your, your medicine you've been on for the last 10 years also increases triglycerides. Oh, by the way, you know, five years from now, you're going to start having problems with insomnia. Oh, well, shit, I wish I would have known that before, because all of a sudden, I'm, I'm thinking there's something wrong with me, I'm having insomnia, or I, I can't sleep through the night, I'm waking up five, six hours into this, turns out it's one of the biggest side effects of beta blockers and anti-arrhythmogenics, yeah. is insomnia. So you start going down this rabbit hole, you talk to other survivors that have no clue, and it's like, well, we have to be our own advocates, we have to do so much research, we have to go out there and do this stuff, because I wish that, I wish that there was a, hey, you're a new survivor, Let's talk about this. Here's a here's a pre-recorded webinar. Here's a pamphlet. Here's some things that other people your age have had to experience over time. There's nothing out there. There's no playbook. So I mean, think about it. 15, 20 years ago, there weren't survivors like you and I. Back in the day when when CPR was a joke, when we were still doing breaths, there was no survival, man. There were people. If someone was a uh, was a vegetable, or, you know, they were saved within that first five minutes and they were on a ventilator. That was considered a save back when I first started doing this stuff, you know, back when it was five to one, then 15 to two, then 30 to two, and then we got rid of breaths entirely. All of a sudden we started having survivors like you and I with cognitive brain functions. So there's very little research, there's very little study about what happens to us when we've been on these medications for 20, 30 years. And now, even nine years into it, I'm seeing the effects with the, I do everything right, I'm eating, I'm working out, I'm doing all this stuff, and all of a sudden my triglycerides are going up. It's like, well, why? I'm eating extremely healthy, I'm working out, I lost all this weight, I'm doing this. They're like, oh, it's the medication, side effects. So now, we're going to put you on another medication. I'm, like, I'm not going to take medication because I'm already on medication. Uh, let's get rid of this. So we already know, we don't know if it's actually preventing me from having a cardiac arrest. We do know it's causing this, 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 and this issues. So let's get off of it. And you have to, you got to kind of figure out what's your risk reward here. Like, honestly, I've got the defibrillator in my chest. It's my fail safe. If I die, I die. And I, I, once I come back, then I'll make adjustments. But until then, I need to start figuring out what's right for me. And some people are, aren't up for that. Some people aren't up for taking another shock and having their AICD save them. And that's, that's okay. But I'm not going to live in this fear bubble and have all these other side effects compound me over the next, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. Yeah, honestly, that's from everything that has happened. The medication is personally the hardest thing, the hardest adjustment in a way because of all the side effects that I experience from it. And I've been on so many different medication, medication and each time it's like, yeah, let's try another one to see if that does something better or, or has less uh, side effects. But um, so did you get a I diagnosis? Was... Yeah, so when I was young, they diagnosed me with a... With a uh, with a heart disease uh, and yeah I went every year like for a checkup but they didn't do more than that and then this happened and now yeah it's yeah it's way more serious in a way right because I had a cardiac arrest so in, a, in another way yeah the medication might help me with my heart disease but sometimes it's to me also I am not so much interested in the quantities at times but more in the quality of my life I'd rather have more quality in this lifetime than live up to 90, but be just unhappy and just be feeling like shit the whole time. I, I, I'm personally not so much interested in that. So I'm sometimes not so sure about the whole medication thing. Um, how, how is it for you? Are you on medication right now or how have you adjusted this throughout the years? 
So when I first started, they switched me up on medications a few different times. We had side effects, and it wasn't going well, and they're like, all right, well, let's try this one. Then they got me into a groove where they found a low-dose antiarrhythmogenic, and it was doing well for a long time. But then we had the problems with sperm motility. Then we had problems getting my target heart zones and my workouts. My metabolism dropped off a cliff, like... All these other things started happening with it, and I wasn't happy. And we've been we've been slowly reeling it back, but now that it's causing issues with you know increased triglycerides and stuff like that, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let my heart get clogged up and get plaque and end up having a stroke or a heart attack because of medicine I'm on. I'm just not gonna do that. So I'm working on my EP now to get completely off this stuff and say, look, if if something happens and I have another cardiac arrest and my device saves me, then let's go ahead and change it up. But I do know. These are the problems that I'm currently having because of this medication. And like you said, I'm already I'm already on borrowed time, man. I shouldn't be here. So I, I'm not going to sit here and wallow on how much time I got left. I'm going to earn every second I get, and I'm going to enjoy it. So I'm not going to sit here and wallow of if it's going to happen again. You know, If it does, it does, and we'll make adjustments. But if not, I'm not going to let these current side effects stop me from sleeping and having a good life. Yeah, that's my mindset, actually, in, in all this, too. If something happens, all right, let's uh, let's reevaluate and look at the situation again. But now, yeah. Uh, so you're at the moment, you're not taking any medication. No, I'm at the lowest dose possible currently lowest dose. in my medication, but I'm working to get off of it right now. I got some follow-up appointments this month to continue mm -hmm. getting off of it all the way. So we're just kind of, you don't want to just stop taking your medicine on your own. Trust me, you gotta, <laughs> that causes more issues too. You got to do it with your with your physician. So that's what I'm, I'm working towards right now. That way we, we don't have any further issues or long-term. I see. Yeah. Very, very interesting piece of information, actually, that you just shared on... Um, you know, making someone pregnant and the sperm thing and everything. Uh, I had no clue at all about this. Yeah. So, okay. There's a lot to it, man. Like, you, like you know, the, the mental health side of it, the, the emotional yeah. waves you go through. It. You you know, there's there's so much that they don't talk about with cardiac arrest survival, man, that you're just kind of, you're thrown into it with the brain fog, with the, the confusion, the lack of fine motor skills sometimes, especially after your brain's recovering from hypoxia to... Some of the emotional ones, man, you'll just be, you get these waves of emotion that come at you out of nowhere. You'd be like, what the heck was that about? <laughs> but it's, it's part of survival and your body is remembering the past. It doesn't, your senses don't forget what it went through. It's true. How do you feel today, actually? Man, I feel good. You know, I'm, yeah. I'm in a great spot. I'm extremely blessed, man. I've got a, an incredible wife. I've got two amazing kids. I run a nonprofit. I get to train law enforcement. I'm yes. still an active police officer. Like... I'm, I'm very fortunate, man. I've worked with several survivors that don't have good quality of life, that have got permanent brain damage, that have got cognitive issues, that have got constant irritability, that have damaged gray matter. Like, there are so many survivors that have it so worse than us, and I want to earn every day I get, I want to earn every second, and I want to help others, and I want to make the biggest impacts I can. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. There, <laughs> There's so much that can go wrong. It, it's not even, yeah, it's just about even a few seconds that more being out or, or a few more minutes and your whole life could have been just a complete different story. It's, yeah, it's really hard to even grasp that knowledge or that fact that, yeah, we could have been here both with brain damage. Definitely, man. I, you don't, you don't think about the what ifs until you start seeing other guys that have it way worse than you that have those problems and the impotency and the, you know, the, the constant frustration and the inability to find words. You got these guys that have cognitive issues long term that just can't complete sentences and just are always angry, always irritable, and they can't figure out why. And it's it's part of it. It's part of the brain damage. It's part of the things that happen on it. So I mean, what really interests me is there's, there's a lot of cool stuff and there's a lot of things that are going on on the military side and and the the law enforcement side when it comes to traumatic brain injuries and neurology and. I would love to see someone to start getting exposed to cardiac arrest survivors that have got hypoxic damage to their brain. Like, you know, some of the hyperbaric treatment chamber, the hyperbaric chamber treatments with that they're doing with Navy SEALs for traumatic brain injury is actually healing gray matter. I'm like, could that could that help cardiac arrest survivors that are having cognitive issues? You know, you see some of the. Um, uh, some of the psychedelics, the Iesco trials, the DMT that are helping, you know, rangers and seals and all these other guys that are on the edge that are suicidal and depressant and that are just pure savage. They're going out and they're doing these Iesco trials and DMT mm. and mushrooms and they're coming back 
relaxed, happy, and they're, they're completely new people. Some of these survivors that live with constant anxiety, I'm wondering if that would help them. You know, things that are outside the norm besides just here, swallow some more pills and see if this helps. <laughs> Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. I'm actually very curious also to ask about, and you already mentioned it, but um, Griffith Blue Heart, when, when did you start with that? So after my cardiac arrest, man, I just, I, I kind of wanted to move on with my life. I didn't want, I didn't want to be a speaker. I didn't want to be a poster child. I did not want to be a show pony. I don't want to go out there and share your story of survival, make people feel good. I didn't want that shit. I wanted to go back to the field and I wanted to be getting a spot back on my SWAT team and get back to my life. That's all I wanted. And uh, at the time, one of the cardiac arrest researchers that I was working with um, said, Hey man, I got an event coming up. Why don't you come and come and speak i'm like i'm not interested in you don't want a dumb street cop up there i'll be dropping f-bombs and doing so you don't want me in front of your crowd and he goes just come on out if you feel like sharing share if not don't I said all right so i showed up and another cardiac arrest survivor was up there sharing and talking about some of her things and i was like huh i feel the same way you know what i can do this so i ended up going up and i ended up sharing and i ended up speaking and uh, it was amazing how good it felt. But afterwards, this, this young girl with her parents came up to me and gives me a huge hug. And she says, you know, I've got this heart condition. I'm basically waiting for the day that I go down. Can I talk to you about something? I said, absolutely. And she said, you know, what was it like when you died? What was your experience like? So I pulled her, I pulled and talked to her and her parents. And I talked about what I experienced. And you can see this weight lift off of her. And there was tears in her eyes. And her parents were so happy. And they gave me this huge hug. And... You know, we tried to get her some additional resources and some help, and she she ended, later I did hear later on that she ended up getting an implanted AICD. But I, I I really felt good after that. I was like, you know what, this is helping others is helping me, and I yeah. kind of started yeah. looking into the looking around it. And what I wanted to do is I, when I got back to the field, I realized how underutilized law enforcement is. I'm sitting there going, we're already on scene, we're already plugging bullet holes, we're already putting tourniquets on, we're already using Narcan for drug overdoses, we're already doing CPR. Why don't we get high-performance training, and why don't we get AEDs? This is a problem. So I started looking at the numbers, and I'm like, wait a second. I said, law enforcement is uniquely positioned to make the biggest impact on out-of-hospital survival. Most municipal agencies are on scene first in the one, first one to four minutes where you have the highest likelihood of resuscitation. On the other side, fire and EMS aren't getting there till 8 to 18 minutes, depending on what parts of the country or the world you live in, right? So I'm sitting there going, there's four guys on one truck responding from a fire department or an EMS station where there's an army of cops that are spread out in individual vehicles throughout their jurisdiction. Who's going to make it on scene first? We're already on patrol 24-7 a day. We're already out there. Why don't we put together something for them? So I started doing some consulting and started looking at it. And the cardiac industry does not know how to work with law enforcement. They have been trying to get cops to carry AEDs and implement systems of care since the early 90s, and it's never taken off. And survival, really? even, oh yeah, I mean, you look at even the ones that do have it, 
they never implement the full system of care, right? They, they throw them in the back of the car and hope it works out. But it turns out, wait a minute, that agency wasn't even dispatched to it. When they call 911, it goes to fire and EMS, and they have no idea they were around the corner from somebody who was dying. So you, get, you have to fix the dispatch protocols. You have to have the policies. And, oh, guess what? we got to pay to maintain these things. Did you budget for in your patrol budget? Did you figure out how to pay for replacement pads and batteries? Are, do you have medical direction? Are you reporting to the state? Well, who's your chain of command? They may have some champion that goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to take care of all that. But then when that commander retires, gets fired, or leaves, the program crumbles. And it happens everywhere because they don't know what to do with us because we're kind of smack dab in the middle, right? We don't have the same protocols and work as the fire and EMS does. But we're also not protected by the Good Samaritan laws. We are required first responders. We don't get to play the Good Samaritan card. We have to respond and we have to act. So we're smack dab in the middle and no one knows what to do with us. So I started seeing this real need for high performance law enforcement resuscitation programs. So I started saying, you know what, if I was going to do this from scratch, what would we need? So I started bringing in chiefs of police. I started bringing in policy writers. I started bringing in dispatch managers. I started talking to medical directors. And my background being in SWAT, being in instruction, firearms, DT, I have a real knack for reality-based training. And I, I know what it takes to make cops successful in the field as an FTO. So I got together and I grew with my director of training, and we created the High Performance Law Enforcement Resuscitation Academy. And we are blowing nurses, doctors out of the water when it comes to our cardio resuscitation scores. Cops are better at CPR than nurses and doctors. And we're able to prove this. So we're going out there by combining didactic skills building and reality-based training scenarios and combining stuff. We've created courses. It's not just a CPR course. This isn't a, here's a PowerPoint, here's some clicker mannequins. They are combining skills. We are incorporating officer safety skills. We are incorporating tactics. We're incorporating preservation of evidence. We're making this for, for cops by cops. And our programs are absolutely killing it. So we kind of we kind of put together the entire package, and we bring it out, and we implement systems of care for law enforcement. And that's what our that's what our nonprofit does. And we've been able to quadruple survival in the cities we've implemented our programs in. Man, amazing. That's so amazing, actually, that you started that. You know, it's it's become a real passion of mine. I never thought in a million years I'd leave law enforcement full-time, and I actually dropped to reserve status. I only have to get my, you know, 20, 40 hours, whatever it is, per month. But the rest of the time, I focus full-time on my nonprofit. And it's been so damn rewarding and so helpful. We actually get to get cops and those they save together when we get to... When we get those phone calls from the guys, hey, man, I just did CPR, I just used my AED, or I just used, I just uh, had a case of hemoneumothorax, and I used the chest seal, or I plugged this bullet hole, I did this. Like, It's so rewarding when you get those phone calls, and when you actually have cops listening about their health, and they go get their heart screenings, and they find out, you know, hey, it turns out I was this close to having a widow maker. It turns out I had this, you know. I didn't realize my son had cardiomyopathy. Now we know what to do about it, because I got my kids checked after listening to you speak, so... It's just, it's been so fulfilling and so rewarding in how I help myself, you know, by helping others and earning each day. Paying it back has helped me in my recovery and my journey and being able to talk to other survivors, other cops, and being able to make larger impacts. You started this when? Like how many so years I, ago? Uh, I started this, you know, the the same year as I had my cardiac arrest, about six to eight months later. I kind of started as a side gig, just, oh. hey, you know, what would it take to get AEDs in the car? And then I started doing consulting and helping our surrounding agencies get grants for AEDs and talking to them about it. And then it was like, well, we got the AEDs, but we didn't implement this. Oh, our training sucks. We have some box check CPR course that's taught by the fire department, and it sucks. Okay, well, let's create something else. And then it was like, oh, wait a minute. How come you guys aren't using your AEDs? Well, as soon as fire and EMS get it, they're not telling us. Well, you're not even dispatched to it? So then it just it evolved over time. It kind of was a side gig. It's a training and consulting business. And then in the pandemic, we said, look, we're already doing this, 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 and this. Why don't we just become a full nonprofit, raise funds, and donate AEDs, and implement our programs with law enforcement? So we ended up becoming a full 501c3 nonprofit. And now we get grants and donate entire programs to organizations. We with like Flagstaff Police Department, we just got a hundred thousand dollar grant from Health First Foundation in Northern Arizona. We bought all their AEDs. We wrote their policies. We did their dispatch protocols. We trained their entire department. We implemented the system of care. We created a sustainability for the next ten years to sustain the program. So like we literally. We implemented our entire program all at once thanks to this grant. And that's what we're doing with other agencies. We're partnering with them 
as you got to realize, like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, cops weren't carrying tourniquets. We weren't carrying Narcan. This was, we only started carrying them out of self-preservation with active shooters and drug overdoses that were happening in our communities. But now we've got more saves from bleeding control and overdose reversals than fire and EMS. This is the next stage in the evolution. High performance training and AEDs for law enforcement. Once they start catching on and once you start quadrupling survival in other areas, other agencies are going to be like, hey, you know what, why aren't we doing this? How do we do it? And currently there's nobody else doing what we're doing. I mean, you can teach a high performance class and you can get AEDs in a patrol car, but if you don't know the law enforcement specifics and how to work within them, Everybody in the, in the cardiac industry wants to do a one-size-fits-all. They want to just slap a stamp and sell it to the next one and move on. They, they're not willing to do the hard work. And that, what works for a small agency isn't going to work for a county agency or a state agency or a federal agency. So you have to be able to adapt to that community's needs. You can't just do a one-size-fits-all. And that's, what, that's why survival has been so dismal for the last 30, 40 years is everyone focuses on the wrong things. Like, Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm all about public access defibrillators. Yeah, we should have AEDs at our sports arenas, our airports, you know, our dentist office. Hell yeah. But 77% of cases happen inside the home. Four out of five. Why? People aren't getting AEDs at home. Well, you know, we spend so much fucking money on fire suppression systems and strobes and irrigations and fire extinguishers and crap. But when you build a new home, they don't require an AED. When you put an apartment complex in, they don't require AEDs to be in there where yeah. you're going to have 80% of your cases. And it's, it's crazy, uh, compared actually, to but... compared to how much we pay for su fire suppression systems and alert systems yeah. to a single AED for a place to be maintained, it's it's baffling. Why are we spend so much money on the wrong shit? You know, everyone wants to focus. You mean, you talk about all these other different things, but we have the cardiac community has failed, and that's why survival has been at that seven to nine percent worldwide for so long, is that they have not done a good job educating. They have not done a shit job getting people to care about it, and they haven't implemented programs that are actually successful. And so that's what we're trying to change. Which that's why we're researching and we're showing the data. Hey, this is a, this is what we've been doing with our program. This is the resuscitation rates. This is what their scores are. They're retaining it at six months to a year later. We're trying to set the set the stage and set the ball game to lead by example with law enforcement and help mm. other industries follow suit. You're doing such an incredible thing with this actually. Um, I'm really impressed. I actually took a look at it and your wife is also involved in it, right? Absolutely. She's my, she's my co-founder and she's the one that educates me in all the hard stuff because I'll be sitting there <laughs> writing stuff and I'll be, if I'm speaking, because I do a lot of speaking and I do a lot of education, I write articles and whatnot. So if I got to go speak before physicians and I got to go speak before, you know, people in the medical community, I better know what the hell I'm talking about, right? So I go to my wife and she translates it all for me <laughs> and shows me how to, you know, this is how you present it, this is what this means because I'm not an expert, man. I'm a, I'm a dumb street cop. So trying to figure out all these different things has been it's been a challenge, but I've got her. My brother's our head of logistics. He came from the Marine Corps. He oh. does all our all our distribution stuff. So he does all the the assemblies and registrations and stuff for this for the state. You know, my director uh -huh. of training is my former SWAT medic and one of the best instructors I've ever had the pl the pleasure of working with. You know, my my crew my my board is made up of law enforcement and cardiac arrest survivors, and they all believe in what we do, and that's why. We're able to be so passionate and do innovative things because we all come from law enforcement and cardiac arrest survival and know what it means. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got your team, like the whole team here. It's uh, it's we, cool we still don't have our advisors on there. We got to get our advisors. We got to get more of our instructors on there because we use guys from all walks of life, and we've got some absolute rock stars on our team. Wow. Yeah. I mean, for everyone listening. I will uh, link up the nonprofits in the show notes because people should definitely take a look at this. It's uh, incredible work that you're doing with this, actually. And you've been doing this now for about like eight, eight nine, eight years. Yeah. Yeah, we've only been a nonprofit since 2020, but we've been well, doing oh, okay. this work since 2014. Yeah. 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 It, it, well,. It's a bit different, but it sounds a bit like uh, the way that I started this project. It came out of a personal, I don't know, need that I was like, okay, something is missing. And I'm not saying there's quite a lot of support groups out there, but I just felt like, ah, you know, a podcast where people talk to each other who are cardiac arrest survivors. Uh, I just felt that I was missing and you exactly did the same, you know, you created something that you felt like, why is this not happening? 
and that's something that we try to do as well you know being a survivor i always try to get back and i've worked i sat on the uh i sat on the survivor committee for citizen cpr foundation which is international i've been able to work with arizona cardiac arrest survivors i've been able to testify for school bills and you name it we try to we try to put the cardiac arrest survivor community first because they're so neglected and we've been trying to do we've created we've created pamphlets uh that you can pass out where the ems groups pass out to family members post incident so before they even discharge from the hospital they have an idea of what they might expect we've been working with experts like you know dr Lori hood who works at the pentagon who's a neuroscientist and a post-traumatic stress expert trying to put together stuff i was able to do a panel discussion with Dr. Katie Dainty and a group of survivors internationally in 2021. We talked about the unspoken realities of survivorship. We talked about everything from the medication side effects to the mental health roller coaster to your workers' rights to all these different things, and that's what we try to do. So I, I also do uh, webinars as well. we got one coming up. It's called Aftershock, and it's going to deal with survivors that have been saved by their AICDs. And they're going to talk about what it was like, the mental health side of it, the physical side of it, you know, waking up on the floor, but, you know, one of them, you know, busted their face open. They're going to talk about what it was like for their spouses, what it was like in their, their mental health for the next few months afterwards. So these are all things that we're trying to get out there because there's nothing. And a lot of survivors don't know until we sit down with another survivor and say, hey, you got saved by your device, right? Yeah. What, what was that like? Most people don't know. Most people have no concept of... You know, the guy, the survivors, we have one of them that's going to be on this webinar that died like 20-something times in a row. He shocked. He kept having a misfire. In front of his family member, he died, would go back out, get shocked again, repeat over and over until they were able to figure out where it was coming from and get him an ablation. So you want to talk about what, what did that do to your mental health, dying over and over and over like that in front of your loved ones. So he's going to be speaking at this next one we're doing. So... We're trying to get a lot of that information out there because there's not enough resources for cardiac arrest survivors or our family members, and they're the ones that are absolutely neglected. Our wives, our kids, our family members, our rescuers, they don't get shit besides a pat in the back and, hey, you did a great job, but they don't realize that afterwards they're going through it too. You know, my wife didn't want to leave me alone. She had my SWAT team leader babysitting me, coming over to the house when she was at work. She was afraid to be, you know, every time I made a noise or snored at night, or had a, you know, a little gap in my breathing. She's hitting me to wake me up to make sure I'm not going into cardiac arrest, you know. All those things that all those things that happened to them. Like this isn't our story. We were we were fucking dead on the floor. They were the ones that did all the work. This is their story. And that's where they're so neglected. They don't get those resources. They don't get that support. Yeah, you're right. And that's one of the things we need to do is be also recognizing our co survivors. Yeah. It actually sounds funny, right? Where like uh, I know that my girlfriend often, when I was sleeping, checked me that I was still breathing, because <laughs> she was just like afraid that I stopped breathing all of a sudden again. But it sounds funny to say this, but you're right that cardiac arrest survivors are very neglected, but the people who saved us, they don't get the credit that they actually deserve. You know, they should like receive a medal or something, right? But it's like you said, they're like, oh yeah, good job, and well whatever well even when they do get the medal the medal doesn't change the mental health side that they're going through it doesn't change the fact that they watch their loved one dead on the floor it doesn't change the memories that they have of it it doesn't change the other the factors that go along with it you know is this going to happen again like you know you and i talk casually about it like hey you know if i die again i die again if my device say does its job then cool then we'll adjust the medication that's terrifying to my wife you know what happens if i do this when i'm driving my car or when i'm home alone with my my two-year-old if I, if I collapse and bust my head open, who's watching my daughter when I'm on the floor? Like, these are the things that are going on in their mind that we're neglecting. It's kind of like you and I are like, hey, if we die, we die. But for them, it's a whole different ballgame. Like, this is how would you feel if your wife was like, hey, if I die, I die. How would you feel if she's at work without you and she collapsed into cardiac arrest and you weren't there able to do something? Like, we, we minimize a lot of this shit and we're not building them up and saying, hey, how are you feeling? How are you? Why aren't we having cardiac arrest co-survivors sit down for podcasts and talk about their experiences, to talk about what it was like being on the other side, doing the compressions, what it was like? Because, I mean, I vividly remember every time I've done CPR, the first time I did it, I was in high school. And back then, you know, it was five to one. I remember the, the taste on the dude's lips and all the nasty breath. I remember every pop. I remember every gurgle sound. I remember every detail about every time I've done CPR and you know that's something that a lot of people don't realize that it can be a traumatic process for others yeah 
Yeah, you're right. And this has actually been something that I've been thinking about as well to add to the project to to not maybe do the complete like in-depth conversations that we are doing, but to to have a place where uh, the survivor, uh, the the people who saved us, f for them to also actually share what it was like, you know. Uh, the other thing yeah. is those the other one that is a hundred percent neglected are the families of the fallen. There is mm. jack and shit oh, well, available yeah. for the people. For what about all the parents that lost those thirty thousand right. families that lost their kids this year to cardiac yeah. arrest? Those people that came home and found their perfectly healthy high school age son or daughter dead, they get nothing besides wow. Like the, you guys went through the worst thing. That is the worst thing I could ever imagine is losing a child, and these poor folks that it, whether they were there or not they couldn't save their kids or we came home and found them dead or they had to rely on a school and they didn't do their jobs they, or they didn't have an AED like that's that's a whole other ball game and those guys get nothing I mean I work with several parents of the fallen that don't get anything and we try to bring that you know one of our speaker one of our board members our board advisors Darren Birch 30 year Phoenix Police Department detective and just an absolute rock star he found he came home and found he, found his 25 year old son dead from cardiomyopathy and that's affected him every day of it. It's not a day that goes by he doesn't think about his son. He shares and talks about his side of the story being being a parent to that and that's something that I just wish that the community would open up. So often we're used to show ponies. It's like, okay, go speak for five, ten minutes before the doctor presents their data and go raise us money because even though know, cardiac arrest survivors they're not even compensated they might pay for your travel put you in a hotel room but meanwhile these organizations will put you up have you go go, go share go speak your story and they go share your story and you get pat on the back you're such a hero you're so brave thank you for doing this hey buy our aeds buy our cpr program buy this thing and they're making all this money and do they share it with the survivors do they reinvest that to survivor resources or research no, it's, hey, that's why I, I do a lot of work for it. I do a lot of speaking, but I'm very, very selective in who I, who I work with, who I speak for, because there's so many survivors that just get taken advantage of. And I've seen some survivors go speak for one organization, and then they signed a media release, and that organization owns their story. And they, they use that however the hell they want for whatever marketing campaign they want to do. Or they take that and say, no, you can't speak for that hospital. That's a competing hospital. You can't speak for that AED manufacturer or that organization because you signed on with us. And a lot of survivors don't read the fine print. They just want to go out and make a difference. So they realize, oh, man, I just signed over my story's rights. And if I make, if I publish a book, they get a percentage of this. Or if I do this, like, they don't think about it like that. They don't. And there's always going to be a line of new survivors that want to share the story and make a difference because they want to give back. They want to help. They want to do something. And that's a way for them to get in front of audience members. But they're willing to give over for free their personal stories for other organizations to make money. And it's like, it's a hard, how do you balance it? How do you actually help people? How do you get your story out there and the information that you want to share without being taken advantage of? So, I mean, these are a lot of things that we don't, that survivors don't talk about until it's too late, until they sign over something or until they work with another organization. It's like, all right, yeah. you were a show pony for so-and-so. How do you feel now? <laughs> I mean, this is personally a whole side of it that I don't have any experience with. You know, I feel like you have a lot more seen that side than I have or many people know. So that's a good word of caution in a way that you're sharing. I try to. I've had organizations try to take my story. I've had other... I've had other people without my permission use my story and it drives me nuts mm. because I do a lot of research and I work very, very hard and I work with third party people to put data and information out there and people will listen to my podcast, take stuff. They will take my work, change it this much so they can't get sued and then turn around and slap their stuff on it. Buy this AED or buy this CPR program. And I've worked very hard to be unbiased and independent from that. So when I write my articles, and when I go out to for, for police one, I try to be unbiased and I present data and let the, let the police departments figure out what they want to do, right? Let them figure out how they want to implement their program. But you've got other organizations that will go through and stock my websites and my social media accounts and they'll take exactly what I say, rephrase it, and then slap their brand on it and try to own and monetize. It's, it's copy, monetize, repeat. 
and they're losing a message they're not implementing the rest of it they'll take this much of what i said to sell their aeds but they won't implement the system of care they won't they don't care about this they want i want to get my sale i don't care if the program fails two years from now it's some other asshole's problem all right we're going to do this part of the training he's talking about this let's steal this from that training side of it and you see this constantly where survivors work their butts off to contribute something meaningful and make an impact and an actual change and then you got big business rolling through trying to figure out how they're going to how do we take what they're doing and monetize this and repeat? And that's where that's where you get, you get a lot of egos. You get a lot of people that are in the game that are doing their own thing that you are a token. You, you're not you're not a person. You're a means to an end in a lot of areas. So and I hate to say it cynically because there's a lot of people in the cardiac industry that, are, that mean so well. They want to make a difference. They want to save lives. They want to help. But, I mean, just look at what's happened recently with sports figures going into cardiac arrest. You've got the, the Denmark soccer player. You've got, uh, you know, on the NFL, we had another player go down. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention names because I don't have permission from them to share their stories, right? But how many assholes went through on social media and used their stories to try to make money and use their story without the permission? You know, here's the, here's this NFL player who dropped down, buy an AED from us today so we can save your life. And like, are you kidding me? You, you know. Nike or you know Reebok or Adidas can't take Michael Jordan's picture and his stuff and then use it to sell their product. They can't take a, a picture of him doing a slam dunk and be like, buy Under Armour without his permission, right? But why is it that you can take uh, a cardiac arrest survivor's information and buy this AED, buy our CPR program, prepare this? They don't. They didn't pay him. They didn't get permission from him or his family member while he was laid up in a hospital bed. And this happens all the time. For some reason, they don't see us as people. It's like, how do we get our message out there? And so many people are so quick to jump on there on that train and drop their name without their permission. Like, if somebody was using my story to turn around and sell their stuff without implementing the rest of the programs or anything that I didn't believe in, I'd be furious, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. for sure, for sure. So, and Especially, I'm not trying yeah. to get on the cynical side of it, but it's you, I see this happen all the time. The industry is so quick to jump on survivors because because it happened in public, they think that they can just use your story. Well, and, it's a good story, right? That helps to sell yeah their product. Yeah. Well, again, then compensate him and get his permission for it before you do it. Yeah. You can talk about cardiac arrest in general, but you can't you know you can't take Brandon Griffith's story and put it all over your AED or your your CPR program or you know your resuscitation quality improvement stuff, whatever it might be. You can't just take their stuff and use it without their permission. And I've had that happen. I've had other people share my story and go into law enforcement trying to make sales. They take my work. They don't credit you for it. They you know they put their stuff in there and slap their logos on it. And you're like really like have a little bit of decency have a little bit of respect at least give credit where credit's due for the survivors that are out there trying to do something of course it sounds so obvious but you're right some people just don't care about it at all uh so wait you you also have a podcast no 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 i do a lot of podcasts I, uh, I'm okay, I see. To be a guest, like this one <laughs> like this one you know yeah i probably do i see probably do about a dozen podcasts per year when i have time because i it's it's a great medium, man. You get a ton of information out in an entertaining way. I get to meet a lot of great people, and I get to get new insights. So I absolutely love doing podcasts. I love writing articles. And I love doing speaking engagements because you get to get the word out and make a difference. But it just depends. You have, you have to be selective in what you do. Yeah. I want to move to um, another question. Is there anything that you would have liked to, you know, after so many years now, that you would have liked – uh, that your cardiologist would have taught you sooner? Or uh, is there anything that you wish you discovered sooner about surviving cardiac arrest or living with an ICD? I mean, the thing about, yeah, you can be taste and you, your ICD doesn't fire, but hopefully that doesn't apply for most people. Too. <laughs> but is there anything like uh, that comes to mind? There's a lot, you know, after yeah. like we talked about, I wish I would have known what to expect. I wish I would have had some kind of mental health resources. I really wish they would have told me about short-term and long-term side effects of medication we don't have to figure that out for ourselves until after we're having symptoms i really wish they would have talked about some of the the brain and neurological issues i wish they would have talked about the aicd issues and what works with it like i didn't even know at the time when they put this defibrillator in my chest that there were better options out there i didn't get to pick what was put in my chest you know i found out years later that because like with some of my problems with the magnets and whatnot is that, you know, I, I was going into jails and booking inmates and going through metal detectors and getting wanded and whatnot. So 
I yeah, of course my device triggered and beeps and all kinds of stuff with magnetic interference. But then I found out that they already had two years before this, they already had AICDs out that were completely magnet proof. You can go do MRIs with them. Well, I I wasn't told that. If I would have known that, you're telling me as a cop, I could have had an AICD that didn't get affected by magnets out there. I wouldn't have had to tase myself. I wouldn't have had to worry about my radio messing with it. I wish I would have had some options, but you're still recovering in the hot. Your brain, you're still brain damaged. You're still recovering from death. You're not in the right state of mind. You're drugged. You're up on all kinds of stuff. And you're listening to whatever the doctors put in front of you and tell you to do. You're not given options, and your spouses don't have enough education on it. You're just kind of, you're thrown into this mix, and it's like, damn. If I would if I could have gone back, I would have done this, 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 and this differently. But I can't. But I, the one piece of advice that I will always tell sur new survivors is, don't let anyone tell you what you can and can't do. You know your mm -hmm. body's limitations. You know what you are capable of doing get after it earn each day you're giving because you never know if it's you're already on borrowed time there's no need to live in anxiety there's no need to sit here and go is this going to happen again what if i die tomorrow what if you shouldn't be here you yeah. already died once go out and get after it man don't let anybody tell you what you can and can't do you know they told me i couldn't go back to work they told me i couldn't do swat they told me i couldn't do this it's, no get after what you want to accomplish in your life and don't take no for an answer. Don't let anybody put you inside of a box. Don't let them tell you you can't do this. You have to follow a certain path because even, even the survivors that want to get out there and do something good, they think that they have to jump on and j join the train of some other organization that's already established. Well, if I don't speak for so-and-so organization, then there, there's my chance. No, do your own thing. Get your own survivor groups together. What, what impacts do you want to make and figure out a way to do it? If you don't like the way that it's currently being done, because I tried for years to work within the established organizations. I tried to get them to change the way they were doing it. I tried to get them to focus on law enforcement resuscitation. I showed them the research. I showed them the numbers. And they wanted to focus on other things that I had no interest in, you know. Let's talk about vaping on heart disease for kids. Let's talk about, you know, the, who doesn't know that fruits and vegetables aren't good for you at this point? Who doesn't know smoking is not good for you? Everyone knows this. Like, But this, all these organizations are spending so much money and they're dumping into these stupid programs that aren't going to increase survival. And it hasn't increased it for 30 years. So... Figure out the impacts you want to make and get creative, get adaptive, start getting other survivors together, put together your own programs. If you're, if you are too afraid to start your own LLC, or your own on your own nonprofit, then you're going to get stuck. You're going to be pushing somebody else's agenda. You're going to be pushing somebody else's time frame If you don't have the balls to do it yourself, if you want to make a difference, do it. Don't wait for somebody else to give you permission to get after it. And that's probably the best advice I can give is you you know what you are and are not capable of. Don't jump into somebody else's box. If they're not doing the way you want to do it, get after it yourself yeah. and earn each and every moment you get. Mm. Yeah, in a way, you have to become your own expert, you know, at your situation. I, uh, I just have one more question for you because uh, I want to be, I, uh, well, I have actually so many more, but I want to be respectful for your time, to your time, of course. But... Um, is there still something that you feel is difficult to communicate to the world around you or to the people close to you? That's a tough one, man, because, I mean, mm -hmm. there's so many things, there's so many aspects to it. That, that there, there's different levels of things that can get me out. As you've seen, I've gone all over in this conversation. I've gotten pissed off. I've gotten happy. I've gotten, <laughs> there, there's a lot That's of emotions. That's the emotion coaster that we were on, right? <laughs> there, there's a lot of passion when it comes yeah. to this. And there, there's some times where you get quiet and sometimes you get reflective, but mm -hmm. you also need to communicate too. You, there's got to be a dichotomy to everything we do. You have to be balanced. You have to include your loved ones. You have to, you have to figure things out, but it, sometimes it can be very hard to communicate. And a lot of times survivors are so dismissed or we're put into boxes and it's like, they, they, they only want the one side of you go out there and share your story of survival. And they want you to be a show pony. It can be very difficult to break through those barriers because you get labeled just as that you're a survivor, go share your survival story. And it's like, well, I'm more than that. I, I can, I can contribute to resuscitation science. I can contribute to this. I can contribute to that. But you get put in boxes, and it's it's hard to tell people you know take survivors seriously. Uh, even with your own doctors, you got doctors that dismiss you, you know, EPs or cardiologists that hey, you know what, don't confuse my ten years of experience with this with your one lecture you took back in medical school. So it, it's being able to 
being able to communicate and stand up and advocate for yourselves and other survivors, like help each other out. Like cause there's, there's going to be so many times where you're in your head. There's going to be so many other times where you, you want to freaking hug or you want to get through it all. And so many times you want to just celebrate and be happy about something too. And that's okay. It's just, I, I don't really know how to articulate it, but there, there's a lot of times where there, there's that mental health roller coaster and you got to understand where survivors are coming from. You may piss them off. You may make them happy. You don't know where they're at and it's okay to communicate. It's okay to talk to survivors about, Hey, is it okay if we do this? Is it okay if I share this part of your story? I don't want to take advantage of using you with my organization. I don't want to take advantage of this. What's the best way to approach this subject? It's okay to communicate with us. Don't just assume it's okay to share our story. Don't just assume that we're okay. Don't just assume that this communicate, have that dialogue. Yeah, I really, I have so many more questions for you, but uh, we can do it By maybe for means, another man. time. Huh? We're here, man. I got some extra time if you want to keep asking. I don't <laughs> well, know if you want you know, to keep the, the podcast the, going, but. The only other thing that I'm, you know, otherwise would ask that I am personally very curious about is you mentioned that you have children, right? Yes, sir. How old? How old are they? Uh, my son's about to turn five and my daughter is two. We started right, having yeah. kids late. <laughs> Ah, well, you know. <laughs> uh, we didn't start having kids until our 30s. We had to wait for my wife to finish medical school and get her board certifications right. and get, get yeah, her job. Time. So it was a while before we started having kids. Yeah, yeah, makes, makes of, of course, sense, right? Uh, but I, I'm just curious, like, how... I don't even know how to frame the question, per se, but, like, how is it, you know, to have had gum, you know, to have had these cardiac arrests and to have kids now... Is has your yeah? How is I know, it actually I know where you're for going. you? It's it's a completely different ball game, man. Yeah. Because being a cop, every day you walk out that door, you don't know if you're coming back. I've had right. I've buried five friends in line of duty. Like I said, I've been shot at. I've had people pull knives on me. I've had I've been in burning buildings. I've had so many close calls that it, it was a. Walking hand in hand with death is a way of life for cops, and I've never worried about my own. If I die, I die. If I'm doing, if I'm doing something honorable, if I'm doing something that's gonna make my family proud, I'm okay yeah. with that. I will sacrifice my life for somebody I love, for my community, for my country, all day long. But when you have kids, yeah. it's not about you're not living your life anymore. My life is about my children and my family. My life is raising them to be the best people that they can be and making them good leaders. Right, so. I never worried about me dying, but now I was like, well, <laughs> did I unknowingly pass something on to my kid? Do I have to worry about them? And I, I get their heart. Since they were babies, I've had EKGs. I've had tests. I've, I've done everything to keep them as safe as possible. I've outfitted all the family members with AEDs. I've done all the training with them. You know, I always want to keep them as safe as possible. Now I'm going to my kids' schools and saying, hey, who's trained? Where are your AEDs at? Oh, you don't have one? Guess what? I'm going to donate one to you. I'm going to train your ass up. I'm going to take all your teachers that are in your classrooms. And I'm going to prepare them. I'm going to prepare your coaches. We're going to, I, I don't give a shit. If I, if I have any, any say, I'm going to make sure that they're surrounded by you because that's where it gets scary is that I, I'm, that, that's my biggest fear is that I unknowingly pass something on to my kids and now I have to worry about them collapsing. And it, before, you know, five years ago when I was a new father holding my baby boy and being home alone with them, that's when I started. I never once worried about going to cardiac arrest, but then I'm like, what if I go to cardiac arrest while I'm warming my kids' milk and I collapse on them in the kitchen? What happens if I'm driving them by myself and I end up in a ditch? Like, that's where it started really coming at me. That's yep. where it started to get at me. It was like, Yep. It's not about me anymore. It's it's not about you. It's about your family. It's about your kids. And how do you prepare them? And how do you keep them safe? And it's it's a whole different dynamic. And I that's something I was not prepared for. You know, I, I've always wanted to be a father. I've always wanted to have a family. And when it finally happened after my cardiac arrest, I delivered both of my kids, and it was the best one of the best things I've ever done. And having that connection and trying to be the best father I can be now. Yeah. There's times you go in your head, man. Like you'll start getting palpitations or you get like a PVC or a flutter. And you're like, before I was like, if I go into cardiac arrest, I go in cardiac arrest, bring it. But now it's like, I start thinking about my kids. Who's going to be there to walk my daughter down the aisle. Who's going to be there. If, if I, if I go into cardiac arrest right now and my device doesn't save me, who's going to be there to show my boy how to be a man. And that's something that, takes a whole other emotional toll for cardiac arrest survivors because you don't know. You I mean at any point in time you could have another one, but 
it's different when you become a parent, and that's something that I wasn't prepared for. How do you prepare for this? Uh, how do you prepare for anything, man? Your kids can they can go out and get shot. They can get hit by a vehicle. They can get struck by lightning. Like, yeah, there's so many things that are outside of your circle of control. You can't be a helicopter. You can't put your kid in a plastic bubble. No, you're right. You can do everything you can to mitigate risk. Yeah. You can have open yeah. conversations about them. And my kids ask me, we talk about death. And we talk about, you know, what what's this thing in daddy's chest? You know, what does it mean? Like, right. I, I don't, I don't sure. I, I keep it age appropriate, but I talk to my kids about that. They know how to call 911. They know how to do Good. CPR. They know how yeah. to impact. They know how to use an AED at two and five. And that's something they shouldn't have to think about, but they are. And I, I, we go into schools and we teach kids as, you know, in fourth and fifth grade how to do CPR and bleeding control and stuff. And we've had kids that have gotten saves. It, it, it saves a lot of lives. But trying to figure out how to mitigate that risk. How do I best protect those that I love? How do I get them to take it serious? Do I get them AEDs? Do I get them prepared? Do I get them on feedback mannequins to see how well the quality of their, their compressions? Do they know where the closest cardiac receiving centers are? Do they know this? Like... If they're home by themselves and they have a cardiac arrest when I'm at work, th there's nothing I could have done. But if I know there's something that I could have done or better prepared those around me for and I fail, that's something that would always eat at me. But that's the best thing I can do is mitigate risk and be open about your feelings. Talk to them. Your kids are smart. You can't hide stuff from them. You know, Have those open that open dialogue and conversations because they're not stupid. No, you're right. In everything that you said, that's the best approach to all this. Worrying about it, yeah, it's not going to change anything, right? But preparing, doing the things that you can do, that's key. And the rest, well, that's, that's yeah, up to fate in a way, right? Just like our new officers, man, keeping them healthy and keeping them fit, training, testing your skills, going under pressure testing, it's the same thing. Prepare your family members, talk about it, train them. Test their skills. Keep them proficient on it. Talk to the play the what if game. You know, hey, if you know you're at school and all of a sudden your buddy playing football just drops in the field, what are you gonna do? What do you look for? What does agonal breathing sound like? What you know? Start playing those what ifs and playing those games. Prepare those and those around them. Start. Hey, when they when their kids when they're in junior high and they got their kids friends over. Hey guys, you ever done CPR? Come over here. Let me show you this. Start training their friends. Start preparing those that are around them. It's okay to be open and talk about it because you don't know. Yeah, you're going to keep getting their hearts checked. You're going to keep trying to figure out if there's any issues with them as they're growing up. But preparing those around them, making this more... Everyone wants to just call 911 and hope for the best, but it, it's a communal response. This is not the responsibility of the fire department or the police department. It's the responsibility of everybody. And that's something we got to start changing. we got to start getting AEDs in homes. we got to start getting people to care about high-performance CPR, not some bullshit box check class where they watch a PowerPoint, they do all of two minutes on a mannequin, and they go, hey, you're certified. High-performance, pressure-tested, under-stress, stress inoculation. If you don't trigger that parasympathetic nervous system, you don't rewire the brain to function in that environment. You won't know how you're going to perform in an actual life-and-death scenario. That's why cops and military do force-on-force. Do that. Prepare those you love if you really want to make that difference. Make this so that every person is a capable responder. Mm. Brandon, thank you so much for you know taking the time. It was a true pleasure for me to talk to you. And you shared so many incredible things. So I'm very excited to actually release these episodes uh, soon. And yeah, at some point, let's do a, a round two in the future because uh, I'm, I'm curious to check in after some years how life has been and what other lessons that you've learned but again thank you for taking the time to do this hey thank you man i appreciate the opportunity anytime i can connect with fellow survivors and hopefully give something because i just like you after my cardiac arrest i would have killed to listen to something like this i would have killed to, yeah. <laughs> to be able to have some further understanding of what i was walking into and being able to just have a grasp and to listen to two people that have been through it experience it means so much and this is what i wish there'd be more of out there so keep doing what you're doing brother thanks and that concludes this episode with brendan griffith and me i hope you found some insights advice and support in this conversation once again, to find any resources Brandon mentioned in this conversation, such as his nonprofit Griffith Blue Heart, which I highly recommend that you check out, take a look at the show notes in the description of this episode. With that, this is your host, Yelis Fass, signing off.
Before you go, I uh, just like to remind you of the Heart Warrior t-shirts and mugs I've created together with an illustrator. If you're looking for a fitting t-shirt or mug that will not only show the battle you fought and are still fighting, but also something for yourself to wear and use that will make you feel empowered, these t-shirts and mugs will be a great addition to your life. It certainly has been true for me. Additionally, you will also be supporting the Heart Warrior project, which will help me to keep this project running. Now, if the t-shirts or mug doesn't speak to you, but you want to support the project, we also accept donations. You can find more info about all this by going to the description of this episode. There you can find a link to where you can order the t-shirts and mugs, as well as other ways to support this project. Or you can go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find this information.